right, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm Tiara Curry. I'm a senior scientist here at the Center for Biological Diversity, and we're so excited for you to join this Saving Life on Earth webinar. I hope you've had the chance to watch The Condor and the Eagle. It's an inspiring, amazing documentary. It's going to be open as part of this event for viewing through the end of tonight. So if you haven't seen it before joining the conversation, you can still watch it after the webinar. And if you can't watch it tonight, then if you go to the Condor and the Eagle website, you can keep an eye for future events. So we're very excited um, to have special guests with us tonight. And I'm just going to ask them to introduce themselves. Brian, do you, oh, and I forgot to say I'm joining from traditional Shawnee territory and my pronouns are she, her. And I'm going to hand it over to Brian to introduce himself. Yeah, thank you, Tierra. My name is Brian Parras. I, I live in Houston, Texas. And uh, I am an organizer with Sierra Club, um, also co-founder of Tejas and media maker. <laughs> um, I do theater, photography, video, um, whatever I can, right? I love storytelling and have been very passionate about environmental justice issues. And also, as you saw in the film, learning more about my own history and where my peoples come from. Um, so I'm part of the Mexican diaspora and identify as Chicano. Uh, my family's been in, in Texas and in, in parts of Mexico, um, but uh, happy to join y'all. We can talk more about all of that <laughs> later and I'll pass it to Jean. Thanks, Brian, um, and welcome to everybody who's here. We're so excited uh, that we have so many guests live. So this is just fabulous, and I, I hope we can party it up together tonight. Um, my name is Jean Su, and I am the Energy Justice Director of the Center for Biological Diversity, and also an attorney. Uh, and what we focus on is how can we actually center justice, both for communities, especially communities of color, um, and our planet in the future uh, energy future that we're looking for. Um, so we're really, you know, our work is, is pretty determined to get that future correct because we know that our current status quo energy system is incredibly dirty and racist and ecocidal. So we're, we're here to um, be part of that fight uh, and, and keep going on. Um, I was born in Houston, actually, <laughs> um, but haven't been back in ages, uh, and I'm currently outside of Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado on stolen Arapaho land. Uh, and with that, I will pass it off to Alana. Um, hi, I'm Alana Cohen. I am currently interning with the Center for Biological Diversity's Energy Justice Program under Jean, which has been a fabulous experience. Um, but for the rest of the time, I work as a freelance climate journalist and a student divestment campaign organizer um, at my university, which is Harvard. So I organize with the Fossil Fuel Divest Harvard campaign. And though we primarily focus on uplifting demands of fossil fuel divestment and sustainable reinvestment, we see ourselves more broadly as a movement for climate and endowment justice. So trying to think about how big pots of money like Harvard's $42 billion endowment could be instrumental in accelerating regenerative economy rather than perpetuating an extractive status quo. Um, I'm normally on Lenape land in Brooklyn, New York, but currently not super sure in Rhode Island, uh, just moved here, very exciting. Um, and yeah, that's, that's me. Thank you. And I'm so excited to hear more from all of you. Um, let's start with Brian. So you co-founded a group called Tejas. Do you want to tell us more about your work there? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I grew up in, in Houston and it's a <laughs> very, very, uh, industrial city working, working town. You know, folks often come here and then uh, make money and then <laughs> split. <laughs> it seems like that at least. Um, but uh, but you know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful town too, and I think the diversity of the city and the culture um, and and so many other things about it are really really nice. You know, the bayous. Um, the weather, the weather's its own personality, um, and and so it's 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 home for me. 
and I grew up pretty close to the refineries and chemical plants at the beginning of the Houston Ship Channel. I still live, you know, and have lived within three, four miles of the the beginning of the of the Ship Channel, um, and it stretches for miles and miles and miles. Um, 18, you know, along the bayou, but then it like spreads around the bay and more facilities. So it's hard to put like an accurate number. Just know that there are hundreds of facilities from chemical plants and refineries to storage tanks and pipelines and rail yards and <laughs> so many, so many other things that uh, it uh, is hard to, you know, not have that impact people's health and the community. Um, and it's also a big part of the culture too, you know, petro culture. Um, and it's directly tied to, you know, I've, I've discovered like colonial um, mindsets, you know, the, the wild west kind of mindset. And, you know, we have one of the, the largest monuments, Oblask in the, in the country in the same area where these refineries are because of that, right? Because the, the, the Battle of San Jacinto took place on the same bayou um, that all of these refineries and chemical plants are at. And so I think about that. I think about that a lot. Um, and, you know, what that means in terms of, you know, the space and how folks identify with being from Houston or Texas and, uh, you know, being, being proud Americans. Um, and so anyway, coming back from, from college, I, I started to, to notice these things more and more. And my dad was doing this work already at Texas Southern University. And he had been doing this work in other places too, prior to that, Louisiana, um, to be precise. And so the idea of looking at these facilities from a critical lens um, really, really started there, but it helped me remember, you know, growing up and having many, many instances where I felt ill and not, not being able to understand what was going on, but knowing that smells, you know, caused headaches, um, knowing that I was tired, fatigued all the time. Um, I had skin issues, a lot of gastrointestinal problems um and and asthma you know it was, it was never diagnosed as a kid but yeah i totally had asthma attacks <laughs> they just you know were never um labeled that and and so when i started to learn more about these things it uh it really became apparent that there needed to be an organization you know uh, a legit um space for people to raise these issues. There were other environmental groups in the city, um, but none of them really working with and started by the communities, you know, that lived directly next to these facilities. Um, and so my dad, myself, and, and several others, you know, decided to start the organization. And I tell folks, we we were working as undocumented uh, EJ, you know, warriors for many years. Um, my dad since the mid nineties. Uh, I started when I came back from college in 1999, and then we got our papeles in 2006, um, and officially became a, a nonprofit now called Tejas. Um, before that, it was UCER, Unidos contra Environmental Racism, um, and it was you know a name that my my dad came up with. And, uh, and so it, it, it helped me sort of practice connecting to place in a, in, a, in a way that was, you know, very, very different, but also very much rooted in indigenous practices and thinking and way of being um, that just grew stronger and stronger. And I always remember going to my parents' hometown of Big Spring in West Texas and, and you know, having very, very similar <laughs> kinds of experiences because there the water was no good, you know, back in the 80s already and maybe even prior to then. So everyone was drinking bottled water. Um, you would shower with the water that was, you know, uh, 
coming through the pipes, but you would not drink with, you would not cook with it. Um, and so that was, that was strange to me. You know, they, it wasn't ubiquitous like it is now to, to be able to just buy bottled water. Um, and I remember driving through Four Sand uh, on the way to Big Spring and, and the air just being foul, you know. And again, I would get the headaches in the car. Um, and, and so, you know, and you'd see the pump jack stations. Like I, I didn't see that in Houston. Like in Houston, it's like it's refining, um, production, and export. But in West Texas, you know, they're pulling the stuff from the ground. So at a very young age, um, in my entire life, I got to see kind of a, a full cycle, right, of this industry, but it wasn't something that I was consciously, you know, thinking about. It, it was just there. And so starting Tejas really helped me develop that understanding in a much bigger, bigger way. And it led us to Alberta, to South America, um, and so many other places. I'll stop there. <laughs> right, ahead, Jean. I, so I, I was gonna suggest because usually um, when we do panels, kind of everybody says their thing and, you know, and then we open up for questions, but um, there's something really lovely about today and I would love the opportunity just to converse and, uh, and you know, among all, all four of us and um, really kind of listen more and, and understand. Um, Brian, one of the very cool things that you, I mean, you know, heartbreaking things that you just mentioned is how Texas is really the home of, um, from cradle to grave, the extraction process. And I think that's something that people um, have a hard time understanding in a lot of ways how our movement hasn't necessarily put together the pieces. Um, and so I would love it if you could unpack a little bit more that idea of like cradle to grave when we're really looking at oil, for example, or our fracked gas right now. Where does it start? How does it get transported um, across you know, countries and continents? How does it get refined? And then how does it get exported and then, and then imported back in? All of that is are you know, five different pieces of a super destructive and super wealthy industry. Um, and uh, it would be awesome just to hear in your words how all of those things fit together and how people and the planet are really devastated at each part of that process from cradle to grave. Yeah, I mean, I know that Texas, Texas is definitely, you know, very, very keen on telling that story um, without telling that story. <laughs> and I know that oil, you know, originally was discovered like in Pennsylvania, right? I've been to Oil City, Pennsylvania, and I've worked with a gentleman who grew up there. You know, he became a really strong, uh, like, collaborator um, with Tejas. But uh, there's there's so many connections, you know, and, and my dad's always called me Lucas. And I remember when I was doing research on, you know, oil wells and stuff, like, that was the first big gusher in Texas, and it was near Beaumont area in the Golden Triangle. It was the Lucas gusher. <laughs> So, so I'm named after an uh, oil well, apparently. Is that a compliment or, or something <laughs> else? What do you think that is? <laughs> I don't think he knew that, you know? It just, it just is, is what it is. Um, those weird, uh, you know, life coincidences. Um, so, so maybe I was meant to do this. And yeah, and, uh, yeah like a lot of things happen at the same time that, that really allowed for this industry to just kind of explode, right? No pun intended. Um, and, and like one of those was this devastating hurricane that completely destroyed Galveston Island. Um, the, the great, you know, hurricane of 1900. Um, and it like, this is prior to like any warning systems. And I think to this day, it's still like the most devastating natural disaster because over 8,000 people died overnight um, on the island. Mm -hmm. And uh, and shortly after that, you know, oil's discovered in the Beaumont area, you know, the Lucas Gusher. Um, and subsequently the combustible engine is developed and then you have a series of like world wars, right? And the need for all this fuel. Um, 
So like very quickly, all these connections and, uh, and coincidences are happening. Um, more oil is found in West Texas, um, which is still being extracted, right? Still being extracted. Um, you have this chemistry boom that uh, then takes the, the oil, right? And starts to find other ways to put it to use other than just fuel. Um, so pesticides and fertilizers and, you know, um, medicines and plastics. <laughs> and now plastics, yep. <laughs> and plastics um, and so many other like, you know, fabrics, like on and on and on and on, because they had so much of this um, product that, uh, you know, they had to find more and more ways to make money off of it. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. It's like, it's just like, let's make money off of this. What can we do? Yeah. Um, and so that, that all sort of sets the stage and, and it creates an entire system that is completely dependent on oil and gas, right? And so since then, they've just been finding newer ways to keep getting oil and gas, yes. you know, to extract it, you know, better drills, better mousetraps. <laughs> um, and then, you know, more sophisticated products or, you know, just messing with the chemistry and making new things. Um, and it's, it's inescapable, you know, in, in a large part of, of the state. Um, and our neighbors, you know, have very similar problems, right? Louisiana, Oklahoma, and, and New Mexico now with fracking. Um, so it is a big part of, you know, how people have survived economically here. Um, and I think it is also, you know, it's, it's created a, a way of relating to the land that is also yeah. extractive, right? Yeah. That is uh, um, very far away from the customs and the habits uh, of indigenous peoples that, that lived here prior to that, you know, and who made a living off of, of the land, you know, even in colonial times, right, with, with farming. Um, but uh, those, those things continue and it uh, has, you know, been, been a big part of, you know, any other sort of industry or field um, because there's so much wealth that has been generated, you know, they, they have been able to sort of, uh, by donating money um, or, you know, starting institutions yes. really control how people perceive this industry. And very, very infrequently do they talk about the negative impacts that it's had on the land, on the health of the people, um, on the health of the environment. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's been our work. Um, and also, you know, now dealing with the impact, right, to the climate of, of 100 years of this. And, and it's, it's beginning to change people's minds, right? Because it's very difficult to recover from three floods in four years. <laughs> but yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's hard. I, I, <laughs> there's so much uh, to be said, um, but uh, I think, you know, that's a very short synopsis of just, you know, how things kind of played out over the years. Tiara, maybe I could fill in with some kind of political history stuff as well, maybe to um, give a bit of context to what Brian is saying too. So one of the things that um, the center was has been fighting for on, on a legal basis actually is uh, a big mistake that came at the end of 2015. Uh, so, Back in the 1970s, the US actually put a kibosh on crude oil exports. And, um, it, you know, the Arab uh, basically, 
of Middle Eastern wars basically uh, made the U.S. feel very insecure about oil, um, and uh, and so the U.S. thought it would protect itself by basically banning the export of crude oil. Uh, fast forward to 2015, and at that point, we have seen you know what Brian basically has lived through his in, during his life, and that is an incredible amount of extraction of oil, of finding oil, of finding new ways to get oil through the miraculous technologies of fracking, which everybody was so enamored with, including the Obama administration. Um, down to what we have today, which is EOR, the, um, it's another extractive oil recovery system, which basically pumps CO2 into the ground, um, as well as with other toxic chemicals and gets out more oil. Uh, so it's, it's a self-perpetuating cycle of, of oil, oil, oil. And um, in 2015, Congress voted uh, to open up our exports our shores and our export terminals to crude oil. They decided to lift the ban and completely allow for crude oil to be exported to other countries to be refined and essentially um, to come back to the US and, and sell, sell, sell across uh, the United States. So I think that um, in 2015 was, was a huge mistake and, and devastating congressional move. Um, at that time, Democrats thought it was a good deal because of, you know, first of all, a lot of them actually have oil and gas ties. Second of all, they got um, mm -hmm. some good wind and solar tax credits. But I think when you weigh those things uh, together, we are still in a fossil fuel economy. We have not shifted to that wind and solar, uh, you, you know, I don't know, mirage that, that people thought we did. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, as one person said in the film, that environmental genocide continues. So, you know, one of the things that we need to fight for, again, when we're talking about cradle and grave to grave is, um, you know, one actionable thing is to stop the exports and reinstall that ban on crude oil, which will actually put a, a really important kibosh on the fracking, the EOR, and all of the dangerous oil uh, extraction yeah. that's been happening. Um, and, and I think, uh, yeah, so I just, you know, that that is one thing that, that we're fighting for legally and we really need to make that happen. So I just want to put a pin on that one. And, and maybe Alana, I'm not sure if you wanted to talk about your recent on the ground experience uh, in line three, uh, protesting and basically seeing what is happening there in this kind of cradle to grave connection that we're weeding out here. Uh, yeah, so um, for folks who aren't familiar, just like the the quick summary of it is that um, the Line 3 pipeline is effectively a massive carbon bomb that's now being built through the heart of Indigenous Anishinaabe territory in Minnesota. Um, when I say carbon bomb, like that, that is really what it is. Like Enbridge, uh, the Canadian company that is building this pipeline, is billing it as an expansion project because there is pre existing pipeline there. But, um, the project would double the capacity or more than double the capacity, the carrying capacity of crude oil. So tar sands crude oil, very dirty form of energy from Alberta, Canada, um, that this pipeline would be able to carry, bringing it to like almost a million barrels, I think. Um, and yeah, I think, I believe the annual emissions that have to double check from this pipeline would be more than like the whole state. Um, at present, uh, but really like what, what this is, is both a egregious and very salient example of environmental justice, the way that the extractive economy clearly intersects with a total lack of respect for indigenous sovereignty. Um, and also the reality that the US has systematically undermined indigenous economies for a very long time. And therefore many indigenous communities actually have few economic alternatives to this kind of extractive practice. Um, so there are many community divisions uh, as a result uh, because some of the only jobs that are now available in these areas of Minnesota come from the pipeline. But it's also an example of just how much more um, this country is continuing to invest in infrastructure that will have irreversible impacts in accelerating the climate crisis, right? Like once the pipeline line three is built, it's, it's going to be used or it's going to be very, very hard to stop it from being used. That's why the fight on the ground right now to halt construction before Enbridge plans to complete it in September is really important. Um, and 
the fact that Enbridge plans to complete this in September means there's a very limited time window, um, which is part of the reason that um, the indigenous led resistance on the ground right now is really calling people to go down and take direct action against this pipeline, particularly for folks who are able to put their bodies on the line directly. Um, that is a main ask. There are also a lot of other ways to like be in solidarity with this movement. And I think it does also speak to the power ultimately of fossil fuel divestment. Because at the end of the day, like at, until there is policy change to stop the line three pipeline or Joe Biden decides to actually like wake up and, and give a shit about this. Ooh, sorry for that language. Um, then like we, the, we broke the, the ceiling. Now Brian and I and Tiara will go crazy. Okay. The, the question is just like, whether or not um, folks can make it too expensive for this pipeline to continue. Like already activists have cost Enbridge like over a billion dollars on the ground just by stalling construction. And there's some absurd number of like sites where the company has to drill under the Mississippi, right? Because water is a big part of this um, and protecting the Mississippi is a big part of this in order to be able to complete the pipeline, which gives like ample opportunity for action to really drive up the cost of bringing this egregious project through to finish. Um, so yeah, I, I can talk more later if, if that's desired about just like being on the ground, but my top resources or top suggestion I should say is really to look to like the indigenous folks who are out there um, putting out a lot of really important educational resources and asks for actions both on the ground and remotely. Um, yeah, I think there's a list that that can be shared, but there's a number of resistance camps led by indigenous folks who are really leading this fight. And then there's also Stop the Money Pipeline, which is a really great and more sort of like remote resource for ways to take action on the divestment end of this fight. Thanks, Alana. And the treaty people gathering, it starts like this week, um, asking people to go up there. So we're going to share a list of resources on how you can get more information and get involved in that and it's just like another dirty pipeline like um keystone xl and dakota access and like keystone xl that was going to bring dirty tar sands oil to houston um to brian's backyard and we haven't really talked about the tar sands process but it's very very polluting i don't know if one of you all wants to touch on that briefly who's been there <laughs> Any of y'all been there to the tar sands? It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's beyond upsetting. You know, you saw the film and if you haven't, there's a part where Melina, you know, reflects on flying over the tar sands. This is her homeland too. Um, beautiful, beautiful boreal forest and, you know, to see what has to happen for them to get at the oil is is just beyond absurd it's like why would anyone even think that that's a good idea to begin with right it's like you have to clear cut all of the forest you got to drain the water and then you have to dig up the soil right because the oil is like mixed in with the dirt um, in the ground and it's so viscous you have to use like huge amounts of water and chemicals um, and energy, you know, because it has to be heated to separate. That's just to get it in the first place. All of that, right? All the habitat destruction, all the contamination of the water, um, the use of toxic chemicals. So now you're, you know, potentially permanently ruining this water, which is a finite resource on the planet. Um, and, and then you have this, you know, end product that uh, needs to be delivered to where? Somewhere in Alberta? No. Somewhere in Canada? No. no. All the way to, <laughs> to the Gulf Coast. Um, because nobody wants to build more refineries, you know, and actually demand has been going down um yeah. and so it has to come all the way to the gulf coast and i didn't even know about this until meeting melina um and clayton and and some other representatives from canada um that were at a shareholder meeting in london um, and i was at that shareholder meeting this is a bp shareholder meeting because of the gulf oil spill that had already happened Right. Um, so imagine, you know, us all connecting 
This is in the like 2011, 2012. And Melina's giving a presentation and, and she shows the pipeline route. And I'm looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. It's like, fuck, it's coming to Houston. I'm cussing because you allowed it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> like, of course, of course it's coming to Houston, right? Yeah. Um, we've, we've gone to so many places and caused so many problems. It only, it's only fair, right? It's like for this to come to Houston and Port Arthur. Um, and so that, uh, that was eye-opening, you know, for me, but it, it led to this incredible, you know, um, partnership. And they invited us up to Canada during one of their healing walks. And the healing mm -hmm. walk was this beautiful way of helping folks understand what's, what's happening. So they actually walk, um, I think 20 kilometers, it's a long walk around the facilities. And, and you see, you know, kind of the end part of that, you know, where they have already taken the soil, um, clear cut the forest. And what you have left is this like dead, white, bleached sand and these toxic tailing ponds. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's soul sucking, man. It just uh, is really horrendous to think like this is something that that we do on on this planet um yeah. and it's it's so bad the toxic tailing ponds that they have to have uh, scarecrows and cannons that go off intermittently to keep birds from landing in the water because if they land in the water oh. they will die um and that happened um and so they you know started to do things to try and scare the birds from, from landing in the water. Um, so, you know, these, uh, these healing walks allow you to see the scale, the scale of this. Um, and we walked past one of the, the huge, huge machines that they use to, to dig up the soil. Um, I think it's like five or six stories high. Um, and we walked past some man camps, you know, like you really, you really get a, a picture of all of the uh, environmental harms, but also the psychosocial harms yeah. um, that come along with that. And it's uh, such a powerful way of advocacy. Um, and for the local communities there, you know, it's, it's healing. It's a healing practice. Um, because they are, you know, putting their feet to the ground and, you know, being intentional about understanding, you know, the full impact and the gravity of, uh, of what's happening. And, and when we left, you know, just a few years after, there was a huge fire, you know, because of climate change. Um, there is a lot of things that are overlapping now and, and causing, you know, multiple impacts um, on top of other impacts. And it's, uh, yeah, it's really, really sad. Um, and it's like really, really stupid for any of us to think like this is for our benefit, right? Like we're not, we're not benefiting from this at all. Um, and we're assuming a lot of the risk um, as a nation, as people, um, and it will continue, like you said, to lock us into this, you know, cycle of utilizing fossil fuels, because once the investments are, are in, like, yep. they have to make their returns, they got to make their returns. Um, it's their fiduciary duty, right, to do so. Yes. Um, and so stopping it at the source is really important. And I think that's when you know, the indigenous leadership recognized like we have to stop these pipelines. We have to stop these pipelines. You know, and it started with KXL. There's still the Trans Mountain Pipeline, you yeah. know, that's being fought in Canada. They fought Energy East, um, you know, 
and we have these now coming down to the U.S. and and we got to we got to do our part. We got to stop these pipelines. Um, and and even when we think we've won, like with Keystone XL, how many yeah. times have we won that fight now? <laughs> it's like uh, we have it's to like keep Groundhog watch. Day. Yeah, because they yeah. will not give up. Um, yeah. So I appreciate and I applaud y'all for. Uh, supporting those efforts and I hope you know you and many of your members are able to you know participate in that um, and and it's 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 like more than a, a protest right it's uh it's a prayer as we learn from Standing Rock um, but it's also a, a duty and a responsibility um, for our grandkids and our children and our great-grandchildren um, and for ourselves you know, like we have to recognize the harm that we have all caused, whether, you know, it was intentional or not. Um, we've all sort of uh, have a responsibility now that we're adults <laughs> to, to learn about this and to do what we can um, to, to do better. Yeah, so I appreciate all y'all for, you know, joining this call, watching the film and, and hopefully you know, continuing to support these efforts in the future. I want to open it up to participant questions um, too. If you that are in the audience want to ask questions of Brian or Jean or Alana or talk about the film, feel free to to put those into the Q and A so that we can we can chat about those. Um, Jean, do you want to just give us a quick overview of your energy justice work? I kind of want to have a broader conversation about energy justice and like the movement that Brian was talking about that kind of started after the BP oil spill and is reflected in the Condor and the Eagle and just the the overall campaign to unite people fighting all of these dirty energy fights everywhere. Like Brian, I actually met you at um, the Extreme Energy Extraction Collaborative yeah. Summit in North Dakota, like in <sighs> 2015 when we were touring the, the Bakken oil shell field. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Um, so I think one of the things that I always begin talking about when we talk about this term energy justice, which is actually a pretty new term to our lexicon generally, um, is to describe actually the different energy violences that communities across America, uh, be they people or, or animals and species face. Um, so one type of energy violence is you know, the type that Brian I, you know, has lived through. And that is the energy violence that we see in the fossil fuel extraction industry, the air that he breathed, the GI um, and asthma impacts that he has experienced, uh, and basically that very visceral and on the ground um, health, health impacts, severe health impacts that communities face from the fossil fuel industry. So that is one piece of the energy violence puzzle that miraculously through the incredible work of EJ leaders across the country have become very clear um, that that is a direct uh, result of our racist energy system. But a second type of energy violence that really hasn't been talked about as much and that we have been working on in our energy justice program is this idea of energy burdens. So when you think about um, electricity and this dirty electricity that we're all pumping through um, to, our, to our systems, there is like a secondary energy violence that people feel from the inability to pay for that electricity and actually survive uh, by having your lights on, by literally having air conditioning in, in, it, in deathly summers right now and having heat in deathly winters. Um, Texas, the Texas crisis, again, the energy crisis there completely shows how essential energy is um, and how communities of color in the states actually have far greater energy burdens than their white counterparts. What is an energy burden? An energy burden is literally the amount of income that you pay towards your electricity bill over your entire income. And in America, black communities have energy burdens that are on average 43% greater than their white counterparts. Native American communities have energy burdens that are 45% greater, and Latinx mm -hmm. communities have it around 27% greater than white communities. Uh, and, and that's just from a 2017 study. So it's, it's skyrocketed since because of COVID. 
And the, the burden of that is, you know, in places like Georgia, your energy burden could be as high as 30%, which means that you are spending one third of your income on electricity, which means that a lot of people can't afford it. And in fact, they are uh, getting disconnected. And over COVID, we've seen that, that unemployment has skyrocketed. Guess who actually bore the burden of that? Communities of color disproportionately bore utility disconnects. And we've now found that since July of last year till now, there have been 1.1 million disconnects across the country, while the top private utility companies have all actually increased their profit and their shareholder mm -hmm. dividends during this time. So to, to put that in perspective, the CEO of Duke Energy in North Carolina, her 50% of her 2019 salary could have gone to save the 40,000 households that she cut off in November of last year. Um, so while families are getting poisoned in their backyards, they also, from this mm -hmm. electricity, they're also unable to access the electricity to like basic life-saving essentials. Um, and as we saw in Texas, because of the market, the free market system of private utility companies, um, electricity is not a human right in this country. It's, it's absolutely not. It depends on how much uh, you make, and it also depends on the color of your skin, uh, and it also depends on where you live. So communities of color have higher energy burdens as well because they pay more for energy. Why do they pay more for energy? Because they actually live in poor housing, public housing, red zoned housing that was actually meant um, to to uh, eliminate uh, black and brown communities from where white communities are living. So we have all of these racist policies and housing policies come together in um, the energy burden factor, which is like a second type of energy violence that we're fighting. And then the third type of energy violence that Brian talked about as well is the climate energy violence. So guess who is hit most hard from disastrous hurricanes and floods and wildfires. It is communities who live on the coast in this country, um, per, per, intentionally zoned places where white communities do not live. And they are feeling the brunt of climate disasters. And that is really, and red, redlining as Brian is saying, that is like precisely the third type of energy violence. So you are getting hit from every single angle. You are getting hit from the air you're breathing, from the water you are drinking, from the electricity bills that you cannot pay. And finally, the storms, the hurricanes, the flooding and the wildfires that are all caused by climate because of that fossil fuel company and that electricity utility company who are still putting you into this system of fossil fuels. So that's the system we're living in. And I think like the most tremendously, the most important phrase from that film to me was that phrase of environmental genocide. The, like this is genocide to its core and Tierra works on the species end of this genocide. And I would love for her to talk about all these energy violences and how they affect every single species on this planet. So when we are fighting against environmental genocide, it is for the communities, it is for species, it is for everybody together, and it's for our planet. And, and one of the things I did want to emphasize as well, um, another fight that's happening right now is, uh, you know, in, in that I invite everybody to come in to, as we're fighting pipelines and line three and all the refineries and the exports and everything happening, is this idea right now that Biden and centrist Democrats are pushing forth, which is the idea of passing a clean electricity standard. So let me, let me just back that up for you for a second. What's the difference between a clean electricity standard and a renewable energy standard? So in the 1990s, a bunch of states actually passed renewable energy standards. And the idea was basically over time, we would phase out fossil fuels and ramp up what we all know is renewable energy. That's pretty simple. It's wind, it's solar, it's geothermal. Mm. Those are pretty proven technologies. Why, who came up with the clean electricity standard and what is that? <laughs> Lindsey Graham came up with the clean electricity standard in 2009. And the idea behind it was to obfuscate what the heck our energy future would be. The clean energy standard doesn't say anything about what is clean and what is not. It's actually based on a number and an emission standard. And all the current clean energy standards out there right now coming from Frank Pallone um, being espoused by the White House, 
all of these energy standards have a number emissions right now that would allow for gas, that would allow for carbon capture and storage, that would allow for the biomass that is poisoning all of the Southeast and the biogas. Everything that Brian has lived through is allowed in these clean electricity standards. So what I am asking all of us to do on this call is fight against that. So we were able to mobilize in one week, 700 organizations across this country who came together and said, hell no, you are not going to poison us with this bullshit clean electricity standard. We want a renewable energy standard. We want actually democratic discussion about what that should mean. We don't wanna be fooled by what a 0 0.8 emission standard is versus a 0 0.4. We wanna talk about solar on our rooftops and in our community. We don't want private electricity systems anymore. This is the type of dialogue that we need for our energy system going forward. And so we're fighting this right now in Congress and this has real fucking implications for the, for the ground, for Texas, for California, who is digging up oil as dirty as the tar sands. So this is really important and we invite everybody to come into this fight with us. It, we have been told from the White House and others and Gina McCarthy that uh, basically everybody who's asking for these things are naive and we believe in carbon capture and storage and we want all of and above solutions for us. It's not naive and it's not, um, how do I say this? Uh, the people who are compromising for this are not the people who have to live with these decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And that is purely the truth of what's going on in DC. So we ask everybody to really come in uh, and, and do this. And Brian and, and Brian's father are part of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. They have come out and said, we don't want CCS. We don't want pipelines. We don't want dirty energy. And the White House came back and said, we read your recommendations, but we don't care. We're going to pursue carbon capture, storage, gas, and an all above approach. So right now we are actually in the fight uh, for the country and our lives and the planet. And uh, we should push back against all the dismissiveness from DC because they're not the ones who are actually going to be suffering or, or who have suffered. And that's why they can say this with a straight face. Okay. Wow. <laughs> what do you think, Brian? That's a lot. And you know, and it's actually, bigger than that but i think you provided folks uh with with a roadmap on on how to get engaged because i see some of the questions from folks how they can help um and it's always a daunting proposition right um because it it's it's not you as an individual fighting the entire industry it's you speaking up and participating um at your local community meetings um and and going from there, right? It's 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 as simple as that. And the more I learn, you know, uh, the less stressed I get about all of that. Um, and I try just to live right, right? I live right. I educate others, um, and and I do what I can, right? So it's not on you, Tom, to take down the fossil fuel industry. It's not on you, Ruth. <laughs> But but you can you can be a part of it with us. Um, organize, organizing is always the answer um, to everything. Education and organizing. Um, and I'll add some that that uh, I thought about while you were talking. You know, during during this pandemic, we know that it was those same communities, right, who are overburdened with pollution that were more vulnerable. Um, to the to COVID-19. And, and we know that these same communities were the expendable, you know, essential workers that were forced to go um, to work without protections, you know, without mask. Um, and we also know that the immigration issue is directly tied to this problem too. We had some pretty big storms hit Nicaragua, uh, Guatemala, um, and Mesoamerica, right? And, and that has impacts. That has impacts on migration patterns. Um, we know that they, these communities have contributed the least 
you know, to climate change. Um, and yet it's these communities, you know, across the globe um, in the global South who are having to deal with the consequences of burning fossil fuels for over a hundred years. Um, so there's a responsibility there too, right? I think we often think about this fight as just being an energy fight, right? So yes, we need alternative energies, um, but we have so many other social issues that have been made worse um, or have been created by this problem. Um, and, and I think uh, that merits uh, a lot of discussion too. And sometimes these are ways that you can, you know, sort of chip away at the fossil fuel industry's power at the local level, you know, at the regional level um, by putting the blame where it belongs. You know, Gene talked about the cost of energy. Um, what about healthcare costs that have been exacerbated, you know, by these industries um, that the public has to, to bear the brunt for? What about insurance? Um, because of the climate disasters, you know, the costs are across the board, <laughs> we're paying for it, you know, we're all paying for it. And, uh, and those are those are really important points that should be made um, at every level of government institutions. Um, so th that would be my response, you know, to the folks who are wondering how they can help. And it and it's, it's, Helpful to also walk around your neighborhood and know what is in your in your city, right? What are the fossil fuel industries um, that are present in your home, and how are they operating? You know, what are the disproportionate impacts? Who are those communities? How can you help them, support them? You know, in their organizing efforts. You know, these are all things that you can do. And as, as little or as big as they may seem to you, um, the point is to do something, right? You have to do something. If you're doing nothing and just, you know, looking for that uh, silver bullet, um, then you're doing nothing. <laughs> so, so, you know, just, just step in where you can, you know, and be a good, uh, be a good collaborator, right? Um, take the lead from those local communities who are directly impacted um, and, and support them. Yeah. Just add one thing also, because I thought that, that was such a good point about looking around in your home and seeing how the fossil fuel industry is present there. I think also thinking about communities and institutions that you're already a part of is like a great way to find your, your role in sort of like this broader fight. Um, there is like no single entity or pot of money that cannot in some way either be traced to the fossil fuel industry or be a mechanism for combating the fossil fuel industry. So like if you're a part of a faith organization like a church, if you yeah. ever went to a university or a college or you live in a community with a university or a college, if you have a pension fund um, that you are a part of. All of these things are entry points into taking on the fossil fuel industry because what it ultimately thrives on isn't money, though it throws it around all the time, it's political power and social license. Mm -hmm. And so every single way in which you can diminish the legitimacy of this industry's continued existence is a way that you're advancing the fight for climate justice yeah. and a just transition to a renewably powered economy. Um, so yeah, look for those avenues. And again, that's, I think, divestment sort of sounds like this big thing, but it really starts with the smallest acts. It's about just like finding that entry point and leveraging it in every possible way that you can. And also building communities that can leverage that power together. Um, yeah, so that's all I'll say. No, have fun with it. You know, our, uh, our, muse our natural history museum is sponsored by <laughs> oil and gas uh, companies. Our Museum of Fine Arts has a whole wing, a kinder, a kinder, you know, <laughs> wing. They bought a freaking school in Houston, our, our art school. Um, it's now, you know, where Beyonce went, HSPBA, Houston School for Performing and Visual Arts. Like kinder totally like <clears throat> put his name on it, um, donated money. And uh, 
we have to culture jam, you know, we got to get them, get their money out of our uh, daily lives. They should not be sponsoring these things. At the Natural History Museum, there's an exhibit of a drill, a deep well drill. So kids can go and like get in the simulator of a drill and, you know, pretend like they're going down and, <laughs> and dig for, for oil. Yeah, this is the Natural History Museum. Um, and so, you know, Tejas partnered with uh, the Natural History Museum, this, uh, you know, fake natural history <laughs> museum organization that uh, was doing work to shine a light on how museums are, are being co-opted, you know, um, by oil and gas institutions. And there's a book out right now um, that covers a lot of really cool, interesting ways that folks have been, you know, culture jamming um, fossil fuel industries. I'll look it up and put it in the chat. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like have fun with it, right? There's, there's ways to do this work that aren't like soul sucking and, <laughs> and heart wrenching. Um, it is, it is a heavy topic and, you know, real people are dying. They are. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's important to, to do what you can, right? Um, take care of yourself, support others, and, uh, but do something. Again, like do something, you know? There's so many areas where they're just like left alone. Fossil fuel industry is just left alone. And there they are, you know, <laughs> winning people over with their money and jobs or whatever. Um, but they don't know the real impacts that are happening. And so it's, it's, it's what we have to do. We have to show truth, right? Um, shed light on all those things. Someone asked about resources or reports that they can use to learn more about these issues and riot legislators. Um, you can find info on our website, biologicaldiversity.org. If you click on energy justice, a bunch of resources from Gene are on there. There's resources on Brian's website, Tejas Barrios, um, and then the Condor and the Eagle website also has links to other resources and organizations and information you can use. And then, Jean, real quick, do you want to, um, is there any specific legislation that people should be supporting? Yeah, uh, there is, um, or it's on the horizon. So there is going to be a renewable energy standard legislation that will be introduced in the House soon to combat the clean electricity standard. Um, and in addition, there are Senate um, pieces of provisions, I guess, that will be coming out to also try to eke out gas and CCS and false solutions from there. Um, so we will, for, for our activists, we will be, um, and for center members, we will be sending around uh, action alerts for you to take action and directly ask your senator um, and, uh, and in your house representatives to please, please, please support a federal electricity standard that does not embed this racism and that kicks out gas um, and, and dirty false solutions from us. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, and yes, if you do go to the Energy Justice website, um, you will be able to find the 750 group letter um, and a bunch of other uh, activities and actions that can be taken. But you know, as Brian and Alana said, really everything you do counts and um, we have to combat this dismissiveness of people, uh, especially policymakers who do not, even if they know what's going on with Brian, they may not care. So we have to get everybody to care. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time, but thank you so much, Jean and Brian and Alana. Thank you to Griselda who's behind the scenes making this happen. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. And um, yeah, let's gather up online and keep, keep the fight going. So take care everybody. Thank you so much. Y'all have a good night.